This is Praveen Joseph from Ingram Micro Cybersecurity, and it gives me a lot of happiness, a lot of pleasure to welcome you to today's training. We're going to be covering a subject which is something that I'm really, really passionate about, PCI DSS. Without spending too much time on the introductions and other things, we will jump straight into the slides. What is the plan for today? We are going to we are going to cover initially a fundamental understanding of PCI DSS itself. We will understand what is PCI DSS, who does it apply to, so on and so forth. And then in the second section, we are going to look at what is the anatomy of a payment card. Those credit cards and debit cards that we are so familiar with and we always carry around in our wallets. What really goes into constructing these cards? We will try and understand that. After this, we will understand the different entities who are present within a payment ecosystem. What is an issuer? What is an acquirer? Who is a merchant? So on and so forth. And by and by and large, we'll try to understand what is the flow of a payment process. Every time you walk into a store and swipe your debit card or credit card, what really happens? That's exactly what we will cover in section number three. And lastly, in section number four, we will have an understanding of the 12 PCI DSS requirements. Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be the agenda for today. This is part of a series of trainings that Ingram Micro Cybersecurity is very, very pleased to bring to you a, a series of free trainings that we've been doing every single week. So today we are going to cover these specific topics and I'm really, really happy to bring you this particular training. The chat window is open for you. Always remember you're most welcome to bring in your questions, your comments, your feedbacks, or even any other um, corrections that you wish to bring about. Feel free, please, to type them into the chat window. We will look at all the comments, all the questions and answers during the last five minutes after this particular session is completed. The entire session is being recorded and it's going to be uploaded onto our YouTube channel. If you simply search for Ingram Micro Cybersecurity on YouTube, you will locate us. You will find this recording as well as 70 to 75 other recordings of sessions, webinars, trainings that we have delivered over the past. All of this free material is out there on the YouTube channel Ingram Micro Cybersecurity. All right, with this context having been established, let's get straight into the slides. We'll start with an introduction to PCI DSS. Now, what really is PCI DSS? I'm sure you are very, very familiar with the terminology of the standard payment card industry data security standard. But what really is it? How does it compare with other security standards like ISO 27001, for example? And why is PCI so successful at securing an ecosystem? Typically speaking, when you say that a company has been certified in PCI, you know for a fact that this company is meeting a very, very high benchmark of security. Why? Because PCI DSS is one of the most technical, one of the most granular information security standards out there. What is PCI DSS? It's obviously an information security standard, but it was developed in order to enhance cardholder data security. If you think about it, ladies and gentlemen, different security standards, they have different definitions of what data they apply to. For example, GDPR, it's a privacy regulation. It applies to personal data. HIPAA applies to health related information. PCI DSS similarly applies to cardholder data. If there is an environment where an organization is storing, processing or, trans or transmitting, credit card or debit card no numbers, PCI DSS is the standard that they need to follow in order to secure the ecosystem where this data exists. Any system component, network component, which is storing, processing or transmitting credit or debit card data has to comply with PCI DSS requirements. Okay, so PCI is a, C is a set of standards which was developed in order to provide a baseline of technical and operational requirements to protect credit card and debit card data, so-called account data. Who does PCI apply to? This answer to this question was, was embedded within my earlier statement. Any entity which is storing, processing, or transmitting cardholder data 
and or sensitive authentication data. What do I mean by this? What is cardholder data? What is sensitive authentication data? Do not worry about this. We will demystify these terminologies in one of the upcoming uh, slides. But just remember, if an organization is storing somewhere, processing or just transmitting any of these pieces of data, then they will have to look at how PCI DSS applies to them. Right now, very often people are uh, I've, I've been asked questions like uh, Praveen, you know, we don't see the full 16 digit card number. We only see the first six digits. We only see the last four digits in our organization. We don't store it anywhere. Does PCI DSS still apply to us? The answer is yes. PCI does apply even if you're not seeing the full 16 digit card number. Right, so even if it if it's only a portion of the cardholder number, you should see how the standard applies to you and how you are. Removing those requirements which don't apply to you. Right, what do I mean by this? I will explain to you as we go down the slides. Now, what really is the history of PCI DSS? The whole standard PCI DSS has been around for quite a long time. In fact, close to 20 years, right? Why? Why did PCI DSS come about? Ladies and gentlemen, the four payment brands, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, JCB, as well as Discover, it's five payment brands. These are brands that we are very, very familiar with. In fact, Visa and MasterCard, you know that if you have a card which was issued by one of these so-called payment brands, your card will be acceptable by a merchant pretty much all over the world. Pretty much the entire world is covered by their network. Now, in the early days, each of these payment brands, they had their own information security standards. They had their own set of uh, security standards to, to up, that applied to organizations which were processing data from their cards, from their credit or debit cards. However, it was just a matter of time before they realized there's a lot of redundancy. There's a lot of repetition. The same organization, for example, is, a, is accepting MasterCard credit cards as well as Visa credit cards. They have to comply with MasterCard's security standards and they also have to comply with Visa's cardholder information security program, CISP. Similarly for Amex, JCB and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of redundancy, a lot of repetition and it was just a matter of time before these five payment brands, they decided that they have to come out with a unified solution, a unified set of standards and just give it as the Bible that all organizations can simply refer to and comply with. This ideology is what led to the birth of the PCI Council. The PCI Council is an organization that is completely independent of these five payment brands. And this PCI Council is responsible for the ongoing evolution of PCI DSS. They are responsible for creating the standards. They are responsible for updating it on an ongoing basis. So it was formed by the amalgamation of Visa, Amex, MasterCard, JCB, and this came about in um, 7 September 2006, as you can see on this particular slide. All right. How does the PCI Council compare with the five payment brands? What do I mean by this? I want to clarify for you. What is the difference between the PCI Council and these five payment brands, which is Visa, MasterCard, Amex, and JCB. The PCI Council is responsible for issuing the new standards. It will run PCI DSS standards through their life cycle. It will maintain, it will update the standard. It will solicit feedback from affected organizations and see what requirements have to be updated, what are the challenges, and so on and so forth. And it maintains PCI DSS throughout its three-year cycle. Similarly, there are also other standards like PADSS, PCI, PTS, etc. that PCI Council is maintaining. The payment brands, on the other hand, they are responsible for enforcing compliance with these standards. The PCI Council does not enforce the compliance. They are an independent body. The PCI Council manages qualification and accreditation for QSAs and ASVs. What is a QSA? Ladies and gentlemen, I used to be a PCI QSA myself. A QSA is a qualified security assessor, an individual who is authorized by the PCI Council to audit organizations and certify them on the PCI DSS standard. So this individual, he or she, they will undergo a training which is delivered by the PCI Council as well as they are required to sit an exam. And when they pass the exam, they will become an authorized PCI QSA. 
They should also be working for a QSA organization. QSA companies are companies which are authorized by the PCA Council to issue certifications for organizations. They are, they are authorized certifying bodies for that matter. So the PCA Council may, manages this entire ecosystem. The payment brands, on the other hand, they have no nothing to do with the QSA credentials, the ASV credentials. But if there's any violations, they can actually issue fines, they can issue penalties, deadlines for compliance and so on. The PCI Council is also responsible for creating awareness and fostering the adoption of PCI DSS standards across the world, uh, across the whole world itself. In fact, every year they organize something called the PCI DSS com uh, community meetings. Um, it happens across different parts of the world and the entire community comes together in these meetings, where, um, including the um, uh, affected individuals, the organizations uh, that need to comply with PCI DSS, the QSA companies, um, the payment brands themselves will all be present in these particular meetings and they discuss what went right, what went wrong in the PCIDSS standards or any other standards, what needs to be improved and so on and so forth. The payment brands, they, prom they define what is a merchant, what is a service provider. They define this in terms of what we call merchant levels. We will talk about this in one of the upcoming slides as well. Lastly, the PCI Council is responsible for promoting and, you know, uh, um, inviting feedback in order to enhance payment security itself. Payment brands are responsible for forensics and investigation if there is any compromise or any breach in um, security of a payments ecosystem, payment card ecosystem. The PCI Council, like I just Hello, mentioned. Praveen. Yes, yes, sir. When you are saying for PCI and payment brand, uh, I, I felt that like uh, payment brands are more uh, rigorous in uh, implementing the standards to any organization, which is a must because it has to comply with the standards. And at the same time, uh, if any standards lack some uh, compliance, then it will implement the uh, penalties for it, just like, for example, if it is some payment on the government site, because you know it is very critical. But uh, payment online, something like that, is it just aggregation with the PCI DSS is more than enough? If I am wrong, just correct me. No, no, you're right. You're right, uh, uh, Mr. Mir. Thank you so much for this point. So it's a very valid point. Uh, and just to add further light for uh, everybody else as well. So what what Mr. Mir. Um, uh, raised the point the point that he, Mr. Mir has raised is the PCA Council they are responsible for updating the standards and maintaining the requirements but the payment brands they can be more rigorous in the in terms of the penalty mechanisms that they enforce uh, and yes this is very true Mr. Uh, Mir um, the the payment brands they can they can legally and contractually enforce specific penalties against organizations uh, if there is, for example, a breach, the contractual agreement will be that um, for every credit card number that is compromised, a fine of four to five dollars has to be paid. Typically, you will see millions of credit card numbers are compromised. So we are talking about talking about four to five million uh, dollars in terms of penalties that have to be paid for a, a simple breach itself of, of credit card data or debit card data. Uh, that being said, let me reiterate, PCI DSS is not a law. Unlike GDPR, we cannot legally enforce PCI DSS. It is only something that can be contractually enforced against organizations. So something that an organization signs as a contract, um, and these contracts are something that the payment brands are already very, very well versed with drafting as well as enforcing across the ecosystem. Right. So I hope this helps, Mr. Mir. Thank you so much for that particular uh, for your valuable uh, input. We'll move on to the next uh, slide. So we're talking about other standards as well, something called PADSS and PCI PTS. What are these standards? The payment, the PCI Council is responsible for developing not only PCI DSS, but also other security standards pertaining to the payments ecosystem. PADSS is, is something called the Payment Application Data Security Standards. Any application that is responsible for storing, processing, or transmitting cardholder data and meeting specific conditions for example, it is delivered. It is developed by software vendors. It is not delivered for just one particular use by one client. It is delivered to be used by multiple clients. In these cases, PADSS will apply. Similarly, PCI PTS 
applies to devices that are used in protection of card holder pins. When I say devices, it means those POS terminals, for example, that you swipe your credit card into. Uh, similarly, something called host or hardware security modules, HSMs, secure cryptographic device, SCDs. All of these are devices that are used to protect the pins, the card holder pins, right? So these devices also have to meet specific security requirements, and these requirements are mentioned in the PCI pin transmission security standards or PCI PTS standards, right? A little bit about the history of PCI DSS further uh, building on. Like I just mentioned, it is not a law. It is not a government enforced legislation, unlike, for example, GDPR. Rather, it's an industry regulation. Just to let you know, some US states um, have recognized the value that PCI DSS brings about and they have actually enacted it into their law. But that is just a few one or two examples. But worldwide, uh, looking at the big picture, PCI DSS is considered to be an industry regulation. It is not a law. PCI DSS typically goes through a three year review cycle. This means that the standard will be revised every three years, right? So the current version of PCI DSS was released in May 2018 which means the standards was published sometime around um, November to May in 2018, and then it gets becomes effective. There is one full year for the market to implement it. The second year, there is a feedback process that goes through, and the previous version of the standard will no longer be considered effective. In the third year, the draft revisions or whatever changes have to be introduced will be, um, will be published, and final review and release. Finally, at the end of the third year, this particular current version of the standard will be um, retired and will be replaced by the next version, the next iteration. Like I said, the current version of PCI DSS is version 3.2.1, was released in uh, May 2018. So we can anticipate the next version to be released in uh, the year 2022. And uh, we, we await this, this particular release. So there were very, very minor changes in version 3.2.1 when compared with the earlier version. So we had version 3.2 prior to this, and there was 3.2.1, which just brought about very, very minor changes, so-called clarifications. And these changes applied to requirements two and four, um, removed the note and testing procedures regarding use of Appendix A2 to report SSL slash early TLS migration efforts. So there were some minor clarifications regarding the use of SSL slash early TLS because they were no longer considered to be secure and how organizations can migrate toward higher versions of these protocols, right? So we have, I've given you a very, very brief introduction to PCI DSS. I'm jumping now over to the next module where we are looking at the anatomy of a payment card itself. Now, what really are the different components that go into a payment card? What you see over here is something which is very, very familiar to all of us over here, those simple credit cards and debit cards that we have in our pockets. If you take a look, closer look at them, you will identify that there are several pieces of data that are embedded or etched on this card itself. Let's look at each of these one by one. So the first and most obvious one is this 16 digit credit card number or card holder number. In the case of Amex, it is a 15 digit number. There is also an expiry date, which is over here, and then the card holder name. You'll have some logo pertaining to whether it's a Visa, MasterCard, Amex, or JCB or Discover card. And then, of course, your bank's logo will also be here, right? So all of these primary components, the credit card number, the card holder name, the expiry date, all of this is what we call card holder data, right? So don't worry about this. I will explain this to you on the next slide as well. The remaining components are more critical. The data that is uh, embedded within this particular chip, this magnetic stripe at the back of the card, the three digit CVV of the card, all of this is what we call sensitive authentication data. So I've written it over here on the next slide. The card holder data consists of your primary account number or your credit or your credit card number, the 16 digit number, the card holder name and the expiry date. The service code is a two digit number as well. All of these different entities are what constitute your cardholder data. 
The more critical data is the sensitive authentication data, which consists of your full track data. Track data is what is embedded within your magnetic stripe, stripe, magnetic strip. The stripe which is available on the back of your card, the mag stripe cards, they have something called track one as well as track two data. Now this data has several parameters which are pertaining to the particular card, including the pin of the card, the expiry date and so on and so forth. Similarly, the max type data nowadays um, it's no it's not always present in, in credit or debit cards. Rather, you have these chip and pin cards. Chip and pin cards they have the chip which can be um, plugged into an ATM or any uh, POS terminal. The same pin of the card is embedded within the chip of the card itself. The three-digit CVV it's also called the CAV2, CVC2, CVV2, CID, etc. But it's the the uh, nomenclature never. Uh, nevertheless, the CVV is always a three digit number and then the pin, which is a four digit pin that you use to uh, protect your particular card. These different components constitute the um, sensitive authentication data of the card itself. Now, what are the PCI DSS requirements for cardholder data elements? There are different data elements that we saw just now. We had the primary account number. Then we had the cardholder name, service code, expiry date, magnetic stripe data, CVV, as well as spin. Can can the, each of these instances of data be stored under PCI DSS? PCI DSS allows cardholder data to be stored. Under no circumstances is storage of sensitive authentication data allowed. There is only one simple exception. We will talk about this in the requirements. If you're an issuer, for example, you can store sensitive authentication data for for a very limited period of time. But apart from that, there is no storage of sensitive authentication data permitted. So if your company is processing credit and debit card numbers and you see that you're storing CVV or storing pin somewhere, that could be a huge um, violation of a PCI DSS requirement. And we will talk about this in the requirements um, three of PCI DSS. Is there any protection required for these pieces of data, which means encryption, hashing, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Absolutely, yes. Under all circumstances, it is uh, re required. Whereas, in is protection required for max type data, CVV, and so on and so forth? It is required, but assuming that you're not storing it, we can say that it is not applicable. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So what we've done so far is we have had a very very Sorry, brief. Praveen. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, uh, I remember that uh, magnetic strip is uh, still uh, old technology and is vulnerable. So it's still why they are continuing this technology. Because uh, I think now multi factor authentication is more uh, better than this type of thing. So it's still why they are keeping because it is holding the data information of a card. So is yes. it not? Very, very valid question, Mr. Meir. Thank you so much for raising this point. So uh, to build further on this point, uh, which was raised by Mr. Meir, so it's it's a valid point because what he's saying is the max stripe data. This is an old, outdated technology. It is not really relevant in. Um, uh, it's not really secure. So and which is the reason it has been replaced by the chip. And this is a very true point. Uh, the reason why we are still retaining these requirements is that in many parts of the world. Uh, backwards compatibility is still a problem. What I'm saying by this is some ATM machines have not been designed even now to accept chip. They still rely on the old magnetic stripe. Uh, not only ATM machines, even the um, the uh, the POS terminals where we swipe our cards, not all merchants all over the world have successfully converted their POS terminals to be ready to accept the chip. So the old days magnetic stripe cards are still accepted by these POS terminals. The transition to the chip and pin, although much of the developed world definitely has made the transition, there are parts of the world where the trans transition is still not completed, which is the reason why PCI DSS is still holding these requirements uh, relevant even today, because there are organizations where, uh, with, sorry, there are countries where max stripe is still being used, despite the push towards uh, the chip and pin. I hope this helps, uh, sir, Mr. Meir. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, sir. All right, so with this uh, introduction having been laid down, let's jump down into understanding the payment ecosystem. What we're gonna do is we will think about 
the next time that we walk into a store and we take out our debit card or credit card and we swipe it at that POS terminal, just to let's for example make a payment of uh, 50 dirhams or 100 dirhams, what is a process that unfolds? Let's try to break down this simple process right now. So there are different entities in this ecosystem. Assume that you are the card holder. You are walking into a Carrefour stock uh, store. So Carrefour is the merchant over here. You have made a purchase and you want to pay by card. So you pull out your credit card and your bill is 50 dirhams. You simply present the card over to Carrefour, the POS terminal, right at the cashier. Now, the process that unfolds involves these different entities. We have the issuer, we have the acquirer, and we have the payment brands, those five payment brands that we saw earlier. Who are these entities? Assume that your credit card was issued by HSBC. HSBC is the issuer of the credit card. So you have an account with, with HSBC, or at least you have a credit card with HSBC, and they know you. They have given you your credit card. Perfect. Similarly, the merchant, which is Carrefour or any business for that matter, they will also have an account with something called an acquiring bank. The acquiring bank can also be HSBC, but for simplicity's sake, let's say it is Citibank, right? Now, these are just representative names that I'm taking. It can be any bank for that matter. So we have these two banks, HSBC over here, and we have Citibank over here. Between these banks, we have the network of Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Discover, JCP. So you might have a card which pertains to any of these payment brands. It does not matter. Now, the beauty of this entire ecosystem is two banks anywhere in the world, it does not matter where they are present in the world. You might be traveling to a different country from where your account is actually hosted. Your account might be in uh, in Singapore and you're visiting the UAE and you want to swipe your Singapore credit, credit card. It does not matter because Visa, MasterCard or this payment brand ecosystem, their network is global. So they will do the linking between these two different banks and they will do something called identification, authentication, authorization, etc. of your payment. How does this work? Let's try to understand very quickly. So the first entity is the acquirer or the, the acquirer is the entity that we saw over here, the acquiring bank, right? The acquiring bank is the bank with which Carrefour or any other merchant for that matter, they hold their funds, right? They will provide the merchant with the POS terminals, which is the card readers that you see over here. And these POS terminals or card readers will have the logo of this acquiring bank. The next time you walk into a store, you will definitely notice the logo of the bank on those POS terminals, right? The acquiring bank will deposit funds into the merchant's account once a credit card sale goes through, which means Carrefour is going to get paid by this acquiring bank, which is Citibank, as the moment my transaction has been successful, wherein I'm the customer who is swiping my card, right? Payment brands, of course, are the different, the five payment brands, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Discover, JCP. They are responsible for transporting data. They act, they act as a link between the issuing bank as well as the merchant, right? So they are responsible for settling the interchange fees, the assessment fees, and so on and so forth. The top, the most popular payment brands are the five payment brands that we just discovered, discussed, uh, which is Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Discover, as well as JCP. Issuing bank is your bank, where you have an account or, or as a result of which you have a debit card, or you at least have a credit card from this particular bank. This issuing bank is responsible for determining whether your card can be authorized to make a specific payment. Suppose you're swiping your card for 50,000 dirhams, but in the uh, your, your credit card limit is only 30,000 dirhams. This limit will be verified by the issuing bank. Examples, HSBC, City, and so on and so forth. The final entity is the merchant. The merchant is responsible for the merchant is responsible for offering goods or services to the customer and they are accepting payments from any of these five payment brands, which is Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Discover or JCB, right? Now, merchants, we need to discuss a little bit more about them. The merchants are classified in uh, PCI DSS based on the number of card transactions that they experience in a given year. If a merchant is receiving at least 6 million transactions in a year, they are considered to be level one, which means 
they have to have a QSA on-site review and they need to have PCIDSS audit completed every year. The other levels are level two, level three, level four, etc. Depending upon the number of transactions, 1.5 to 6 million, 20K to 1.5 and so on and so forth. Now there are slight variations in the way each payment brand um, defines these numbers. So Visa and MasterCard, they follow this particular um, uh, numbering system where you have up to 6 million transactions and so on and so forth. There are slight variations in the numbers that you'll see for Amex as well as Discover and JCB. I've not included them in the slide, but this slide is just to give you the picture of how we are classifying different merchants based on the number of transactions. Based on the level of the merchant, there are specific requirements. If it's a level one merchant, every year they need to have a QSA on-site review, which means every year they need to invite the QSA. This guy needs to come to their office and complete a full site, uh, a full fledged audit of the environment itself and give them a certificate that yes, you guys are compliant with PCIDSS. They also need to carry out something called a network security scan, which is an ASV every single quarter. We will talk about this in requirement 11 of PCIDSS during today's training. The other levels, they need to follow something called a self-assessment questionnaire. It's something like a self-check against PCIDSS requirements. They don't necessarily need to invite a QSA, right? So based on the number of transactions that they have, the PCI Council has simplified the compliance efforts that organizations need to take, right? Now, what is the process that unfolds every time a card is actually swiped? This is exactly what I wanted to explain to you. When you swipe your card for, for 500 dirhams or 50 dirhams at card four, what is the process that happens? The first process is what we call authorization. The merchant must obtain payment approval from the issuing bank. So in very simple steps, what happens is, the card holder presents the credit card. His card details are sent to the acquiring bank. So what happens is the POS terminal belongs to Citibank. It has absorbed the details of your card and these details are sent over to Citibank, the acquiring bank, right? The acquiring bank will take all these details of the transaction and pass it on to the payment brand network, point number three over here. The payment brand network is nothing but Visa, MasterCard, JCB, Amex, and they are responsible for routing this information over to the issuing bank, which means they will identify from that card number, right, this card belongs to HSBC, let's forward it over to HSBC. So as you can see, Visa, MasterCard, JCB, Amex, their USP lies in providing this global network through which banks can talk to each other. The, the problem of interoperability across banks is resolved as a, because of this global chain that they are, that they are able to offer. Now, what, are, what is the next step? Authentication. The issuing bank will receive the request to authorize my, my transaction, you being you or me being the cardholder, and they will validate the credit card number. They will check the bank balance or the credit card um, limit. They will also match the billing address. They will validate the CVV and so on and so forth. If everything checks out, they will approve it and they will say that, yes, this person is, um, is authorized to make this particular transaction payment can be approved. If there is any small error, like the CVV was entered incorrectly, the PIN was entered incorrectly, or uh, there is no balance left in the person's account, the transaction would be declined. So this response is returned by the issuing bank, right? The merchant's POS terminal will collect all authorized transactions at the end of the day in something called a batch file. This batch file has a list of all such transactions which were completed throughout the course of that particular business day, right? The merchant will provide the customer a receipt to complete the entire sale. The next step is what we call clearing and settlement. Now, there's been a transaction which has been carried out on your credit card. Your payment has been approved and the product has been sold to you. With this being completed, you are free to now go home with the product. The payment has been completed. All this was done in just a matter of seconds. However, the different entities that were involved in this ecosystem, they still need to be paid. The acquiring bank needs to be paid. Visa, MasterCard, they need to be paid. The issuing bank, they need to ensure that there is a statement that is, uh, sorry, this transaction is reflected in the cardholder's statement. All of this is carried out in this final phase, which is what we call clearing and settlement. 
like I just mentioned earlier, at the end of that business day, in a batch file, all the approved transactions will be consolidated, right? In something called a batch file, and this happens for every POS terminal, in the uh, for every ca you know cashier, let's say, uh, at the uh, at the merchant's site. At the end of the business day, the merchant will send all these approved transactions to the acquiring bank, which is Citibank. This acquiring bank will route this information to Visa or MasterCard in a clearing message or something called settlement. They will forward these messages to the respective banks. So, for example, if there were 10 customers, each customer came from HSBC, Citibank, uh, Emirates NBD, F F FAB, so on and so forth. Each of these banks will receive these transactions in clearing messages that were sent by Visa or MasterCard. It will forward them to each issuing bank. Within 24 to 48 hours, the issuing bank will pay this money over to the acquiring bank. The payment brand, they will pay the acquiring bank, but they will also take a small percentage. This is exactly where Visa and MasterCard, they will make a small cut for every single transaction. This is why when you walk into the smaller stores, for example, they tell you that we will not accept card payment unless you're making a minimum purchase of 15 dirhams or 10 dirhams. Because if it is below this, they'll simply be paying margin over to Visa, MasterCard and so on. It's not worth the profit for the merchants. That's the reason they insist on a minimum uh, charge for in order for credit cards to be accepted. Because as you see over here in point number five, Visa and MasterCard, they will take their respective percentages. The acquiring bank will also take that percentage and, and credit the balance money to the merchant's account. The issuing bank, on the other hand, they will issue the bill to the cardholder they will receive the statement, they will pay the bill. So very, very simple ecosystem, but there is very, very high value as you can see. The next time you walk into a credit card store, uh, into a store and you swipe your credit card, just spare some thought for this beautiful process that, un uh, that unfolds for every time that you swipe your card. Ladies and gentlemen, we are jumping now to the next part of today's training, which is the actual PCI DSS requirements itself. So what I've done now is I've laid the foundation by explaining to you a little bit about what is PCI DSS, the history of PCI DSS, the anatomy of the payment card, what is cardholder data, what is sensitive authentication data. And we also had a very, very quick walkthrough of the process that unfolds every time you swipe your credit card or debit card, the payment process itself. Now we are coming to the actual core of today's presentation of today's training, which is the PCI DSS requirements itself. Now, PCI requirements are classified into these six broad categories. Build and maintain a secure network and systems. Protect cardholder data. Maintain a VM vulnerability management program. Access control. Monitor and test your networks maintain a security policy. These are the six broad domains of PCI DSS. Now these domains are broken down into 12 PCI DSS requirements. Maybe you're already familiar with them. What we're going to do is we'll have a very, very high level overview of each of these 12 requirements right now. And just to let you know, these 12 requirements are further broken down into sub requirements and these sub requirements number to more than 330, right? PCI DSS, ladies and gentlemen, let me repeat this. It is one of the most technical, one of the most granular information security standards in the world. When you comply with PCI, it's very, very different from ISO 27001. Let me illustrate this. In ISO, it is up to you to find out how a control applies to your organization. And if it does apply, what is the extent to which you need to implement compliance with that particular control? You need to take a risk-based approach to comply with ISO controls. Right in PCI DSS, it is binary. What I mean by this is it is yes or no. Does the requirement apply to you? Yes. Do you comply with it in the true spirit and intent of PCI DSS standards? If the answer is no, you fail the entire PCI DSS audit. You cannot pass the PCI audit. You have to have a yes for every single requirement that applies to you. And if it does not apply to you, you need to prove how it does not apply to you. So complying with PCI, it is no mean feat. Many organizations, they have successfully achieved compliance, they have successfully maintained compliance, and they have also fought or prevented many security incidents from happening by maintaining PCI DSS compliance. 
This being said, let me tell you this. There have been cases where organizations were certified PCI compliant, but they still got hacked. They still got breached. Heartland payment systems, Target, the one of the largest uh, retail chains in the US. All of these organizations were actually certified PCI when they were when they were hacked. Why did this happen? There are specific you, when you look at the requirements, we will cover this right now. You we will see that PCI emphasizes ongoing maintenance of compliance. You will be certified once every year. We saw this in the earlier slide. On the 1st of Jan, for example, the 1st of Jan 2020, you were certified PCI DSS. But there are requirements that tell you you need to maintain compliance throughout the 12 months of the year 2020. The moment this there is a lapse on this um, on this front, that is more than enough for a hacker to find a way to penetrate the environment. What are these controls? How do they work? Let's try to break them down right now. We'll start with requirement one, install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect cardholder data. Now requirement one is something which is very, very applicable to network engineers, system administrators. They would come in and requirement two. For network engineers, requirement one is the most important requirement because it is what I like to call the firewalls requirement. This requirement tells you all systems must be protected from unauthorized access from untrusted networks, right? Including e-commerce, employee internet access through desktop browsers, employee email access, so on and so forth. There are several key requirements in this particular requirement one. What are these? First of all, it tells you you need to have a formal process for making any changes to your organization's network. What do I mean by this? If someone wants to have access to www.facebook.com, um, it is blocked in the office. He doesn't just walk up to the IT admin and tell him, uh, boss, can you please, you know, white label or whitelist Facebook just for me? I just need it for two days for this purpose. It doesn't work like this. You need to have a formal maker checker and approval process, which means he has to raise a request. The request has to be reviewed. It has to be approved. It has to be documented. It has to be um, uh, there has to be a post implementation review, so on and so forth. So there should be a formal change management process when it comes to networks. The second requirement is you need to have an updated network diagram, updated cardholder data flow diagram, card data flow diagram as well. Network diagram should be updated in order to demonstrate or depict what are the different components? What are the different sections of your company's network? It's like this. I have a building, but I don't have the floor plan of this building. How am I going to secure this? Similarly, if you don't have the architecture, the layout of your network, there is no way you're going to secure it. You need to have this updated at all points of time. You need to have a cardholder data flow diagram. This diagram will tell you how does cardholder data flow within your organization's business processes? Where, where, what are the servers where it is stored? What are the firewalls through which it is flowing? Who are the desktops? Who are the users and their desktops where this is being seen? Cardholder data. This also has to be updated at all points of time. Different roles and responsibilities for network administration, network management have to be defined, documented, and updated. There should be something called a firewall business justification document. What does this mean? This means if you you probably seen firewall ACLs, right? You're probably familiar with firewall access control list. An access control list is a simple rule that defines from what IP address to what IP address traffic will be denied or will be permitted. Now, typically when you have these rules defined, you should also have a business justification. You decided to allow traffic from IP A to IP B. What is the business justification for this? This justification is what should be captured in something called firewall rule business justification document. It will tell you what is the business rationale behind every single access control list on the firewall. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll remind you again, your questions are always welcome. Uh, please type them into the chat window or unmute yourself at any point of time um, and, and express your questions at any point. Thank you so much. There is also a requirement for rule review of firewalls once every six months, which means any outdated ACLs, any insecure ACLs, any ACLs which were incorrectly deployed and someone deployed them but forgot to remove them. All of these um, errors, you can capture them simply by having a process to review the rules of firewalls once every six months. You remember I told you this, PCI requires a lot of ongoing security maintenance activities. The moment these fail is when hackers will be able to get through the organization. This activity is one of those. Every six months, review the rules of all your firewalls. 
firewalls have to have solid architectures, which means you need to have a DMZ that is configured. You need to have a firewall um, uh, between every between the internal network as well as between the external network, for example, the Internet. You need to have a firewall between wireless networks as well as a cardholder data environment, so on and so forth. So there are multiple requirements here for the ways in which firewalls have to be deployed in your organization's network. You need to have solid configurations of firewalls, which means insecure protocols, insecure um, services, etc., should be completely blocked. Services, ports, protocols, like for example, FTP is insecure, uh, HTTP is insecure. All of these insecure ACLs, uh, insecure protocols should not be allowed in the firewall itself. We also spoke earlier about SSL slash TLS, which was proven to be um, vulnerable thanks to Heartbleed and Poodle attacks. These are also clearly called out in PCI DSS. You're not allowed to use SSL or early versions of TLS. The next requirement is requirement two. Do not use any vendor supplied defaults for system passwords and other security parameters. Let me ask you a simple question. Now, many of us are working from home. Your home Wi-Fi router. Have you have you ever taken the time to check if the default admin username, admin password of your router has been changed. For example, if you're using a Linksys router, your username is probably admin and your password is five zeros. This information is available on the internet. Anybody can easily access it. Many of us home users of the internet, we forget that we are required to go and you know change these usernames and passwords by connecting to the console of our home Wi-Fi routers. We are supposed to change them. If not, anybody else can easily connect to it and completely start either stealing our Wi-Fi or um, misconfiguring the entire router itself. This simple use case is what this requirement is trying to protect organizations against. Malicious individuals, they often use vendor default passwords, vendor default settings, and they use this to compromise systems. Organizations should change these default settings before they deploy systems into production. So what are the components of requirement two? When you're using a vendor issued firewall server or any other system component or network component, change the default configurations that were applied by the vendor, default usernames, default passwords. Have only one primary function per server, which means for the same IP address, which is x.x.40.48 .x or whatever it is, you can't have the same IP address functioning as both antivirus as well as Active Directory. That is not allowed. You need to have only one primary function per server. This means you can go for virtualization, which uh, as a result of which you can define two virtual servers on this one IP address. And one of this can be the Active Directory. The other one can be the antivirus, but no, two functions on the same server is not allowed under, under PCI DSS because they will contradict with each other. They will overload the system and the entire functionality will not be achieved in an efficient manner. Remove all the unnecessary functions. If there is any non-console admin access, encrypted. What do I mean by non-console admin access? In many large organizations, the IT team, they will have their own separate dedicated IT wing. They are sitting in their seats, they have their desktops, they are very comfortable. But the data center will be in a separate room altogether. When the ad IT admin, he wants to connect to a particular firewall, he has two options. One, he can physically walk to the data center take a console cable, connect it to the firewall or server that he wants to connect to, and then connect a laptop, uh, sorry, connect a monitor to it and a keyboard, and he can start, um, uh, you know, accessing the admin uh, admin panel of this particular device. This is a longer and more painful way. The shorter way is they want to be comfortable. They want to sit in their IT, uh, in their IT wing, in their desks, and from here remotely connect to their devices, to the servers, firewalls, and so on. When they are doing this, it has to be encrypted because it is possible for attackers to sniff admin usernames, admin passwords simply through man in the middle attacks or any other password sniffing attacks. If it is encrypted, there is an additional layer of security, which is what PCI DSS is asking for. If you're a shared hosting provider, like a cloud service provider, you should protect every entity's hosted environment as well as cardholder data appropriately. All right, so moving on to requirement three. Now, requirement three is the most important Sorry, requirement. Yes, yes, sir. Okay, uh, first thing uh, for the PCI DSS compliance, uh, what exactly is the ISO match for this one? I mean, what is the certification a organization should have to 
have the compliance uh, if it is already PCI DSS, what is the match for it? First question. Second thing is that uh, uh, these requirements are audited. The checklist is exactly because I remember that uh, uh, there are like uh, something to have the compliance certificate. You have like something like uh, if it is not compliance, you give the time and like that. And then in this time you have to comply for the particular things within days, right? So is there anything like that, a uh, standard auditing charter or something like that for this type of requirement to be seen in the checklist? OK, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mir. So the first question was, um, if I understood right, between um, between PCI DSS as well as ISO, the mapping between these two standards, and what are the certifying bodies for PCI DSS when you compare it with ISO? This was the first question. Um, so PCI DSS mapping with ISO 27001, there are a lot of similarities, uh, but PCI touches upon specific domains which you won't find in ISO, which, which are not specifically called out in ISO 27001. Um, so, for example, PCI DSS tells you that you need to check for wireless networks every uh, quarter. You need to perform VA every quarter. You need to perform PT every year, so on and so forth. ISO will call it all out as just one generic requirement. You need to have wireless security. You need to have um, have a vulnerability management program and so on. So ISO is more broad. PCI is very, very tailored for cardholder data. ISO can be applied to any sort of information security management system. So that is very broad. Uh, PCI is very specific. Um, in terms of certifying bodies, we, we you can find a list of PCI QSA organizations when you go to the PCI Council's website. So on uh, PCI SSC, if you simply Google these uh, six letters, PCI SSC, you will find the website of PCI Council. And there they have a list of certifying bodies. These organizations, they can be hired uh, in order to um, uh, in order to come and certify your organization in PCI DSS. That being said, let me also remind you, Ingram Micro, we offer PCI DSS, um, you know, certification assistance. We will help. We can help organizations to come to a uh, to a level of certification readiness. Also, we have tie ups with many of the certification bodies. We can also link you up directly with PCI DSS certifying bodies as well as all as part of one uh, value added relationship. So if you are seeking this compliance journey with PC, along PCI DSS, just let me know. We can definitely handhold you along the entire journey. We have the expertise. I, I used to be a PCI QSA myself, like I mentioned earlier, and we can bring you to the state where you're ready for certification in PCI. Um, the second question Mr. Meer raised was about the timelines for compliance. Like if there is a PCI DSS audit and you find that there was one or two requirements which were not uh, being met, uh, what will happen is that your annual certification for PCI DSS, you need to make sure you don't uh, lapse it, which means at least before the anniversary date of your PCI uh, DSS certificate, you need to close all the gaps. What do I mean by this? For example, your certificate was last issued on uh, 1st of Jan 2020. So you should at least within uh, September of 2020, you should start working with the QSA for the next for the year 2021. If there are any issues, you still have time, sufficient time. And before 1st of Jan 2021, you can mitigate all the issues and you can, um, you know, you can get the compliance certificate itself. But if you still, the only issue will be when com when companies, they invite the QSAs too late, as a result of which the only out um, uh, impact will be that their anniversary date has been missed. So it won't be like a successful recertification. It'll look like a new certification. What they want is, to say that we have successfully recertified in PCI DSS, uh, but this won't be possible. They'll have to say that we have been certified in PCI DSS. Like it, it looked, it looked like a new certification altogether. So during that interim period, when your certification expired, and when you got your fresh certification, technically you were not PCI DSS certified during that interim period. This is a situation that everybody wants to avoid. They want to achieve the state of certification readiness before the anniversary date itself. Right, I hope that helped, Mr. Mir. Yeah, uh, so it means uh, the uh, and uh, what I understand is that the majority of the PCI DSS certification or compliance is uh, for the issuer and uh, the acquirer mainly, isn't it? Uh, no, 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 Mr. Mir. So the majority of the requirements are for the merchants, merchants and service providers. Issuers and acquirers, they are the banks. 
And uh, yes, banks also have to be certified, yes. But the majority of the requirements will apply to uh, issuers as well as service providers and uh, as well as, of course, issuers and acquirers, as you said. So in case if uh, an organization is already ISO certified to 27K, that means they are still uh, not compliance with PCI DSS. No, no, no. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. You can't say so that I'm any, ISO. Any financial uh, matter comes, then they have to be there for PCI DSS. It is a compulsory, then they have to have a certification for PCI DSS then. Correct, correct. This is correct. PCI DSS is a separate certification, uh, certification and they'll have to get this separately from ISO. So, so Mr. Mir, we, I'm happy to speak with you after as well separately because uh, um, I, I would definitely like to uh, love to have this conversation with you, if that's okay. Thank you very much. Sure, Thank sure, you. sir. I will speak to you after this uh, training as well. Thank you. So the next requirement is uh, requirement three, where we talk about protection of stored card cardholder data. If you remember, cardholder data consists of cardholder name, uh, the 16-digit card numbers. Um, the expiry date and the service code. You can store it. PCI DSS allows us to store it, but you need to protect it. That is exactly what requirement three tells us or tells us about. So it tells you first of all, keep stored cardholder data to a minimum, which means you need to have at least um, a, a quarterly process to perform a data discovery check. See if there's any extra cardholder data that you're storing, and if you don't need it, just get, uh, delete it securely, which means perform clearing, purging, uh, degaussing, etc. Do not store sensitive authentication data after authorization. This is the exception that I told you about earlier. SAD or sensitive authentication data, PCI DSS does not allow us to store it. Only an issuer can store it, an issuing bank can store it, and that will only up to the process of authorization. He can store your CVV, but the moment he has authorized the payment and it has been verified that yes, the CVV is correct, he or she, the issuing bank, they don't need to store the CVV, the, the CVV and the sensitive authentication data. Do not store track data, do not store CVV, do not store any PIN. Mask PAN, which means only the first six and last four digits. If you're storing the PAN protected, which means you can perform encryption, you can perform hashing, right? And under encryption, you can perform file level, disk level encryption. PCI DSS talks about all of these in detail. Lastly, you need to have secure key management procedures, cryptographic procedures as well to protect the pins pertaining to your encrypted data. The next requirement is about encryption of transmitted cardholder data when you're transmitting it over open public networks. What are open public networks? When you're transferring cardholder data over the internet, over SMS, over email, or over chat, you will need to ensure that it is encrypted. So encrypt cardholder data during transmission over open public networks. If you are and if you are using any wireless networks, encrypt them as well. Never send unprotected primary account number using email, chat, SMS, etc., and so on and so forth. Right. So the next requirement is about malware. Requirement five is what I like to call the antivirus requirement or the malware requirement. So it tells you protect all systems against malware, which means you need to have an antivirus installed on all systems. Update the signatures of the antivirus, perform periodic scanning, automatic scans on a daily basis at least. Prevent the end users from disabling the antivirus. All of these requirements are mentioned in requirement five. Very, very short, simple requirement. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, what we've seen so far is we are looking at requirements for building and maintaining strong networks, secure configuration of devices, requirement two, protection of stored cardholder data and requirement three, protection of transmitted cardholder data, requirement four, and requirement five is the antivirus requirement. Now, in requirement six, we will look at two specific domains, patch management as well as software development. Right. If you're developing an application specifically for one company, that is your company maybe, and this application is going to have cardholder data, then this has to comply with requirement six. Secure coding, code review, secure application, uh, sorry, secure coding checklist like the OASP top 10. You, you need to deploy a web application firewall, 
All of this will come in in this particular requirement. Also, it tells you you need to have a formal patch management procedure in place. You know the, the patch management process. You, you are familiar probably with the patch Tuesdays from Microsoft. Every second Tuesday of the month, patches are released. You need to have a mechanism to identify these patches, perform a risk-based prioritization, and then deploy them. Of course, before this, you need to define a rollback mechanism. All of this is mentioned in requirement six. Requirement seven talks about need to know, which means restrict access to cardholder data only when there is a business need to know. So this talks about access control. If you think about it, make sure there is role based access to cardholder data and it is provided on the principle of need to know along with lease privileges. Requirement eight, on the other hand, talks about authentication and identification. So identification and authentica authentication of people who are accessing the cardholder data environment. You need to have a unique user ID. You need to have a unique password. Set the password history, account lockout, session timeout, password settings, so on and so forth. Also, there has to be a multi-factor authentication defined for any non-console admin access or any remote access to the cardholder data environment. Right. So the next requirement is requirement nine, which is the physical security requirement. This requirement talks about physical security aspects. It tells you that you need to have CCTVs in place, access control mechanisms in place, visitor management in place, uh, media need to be protected if they are storing cardholder data, so on and so forth. If there is any publicly accessible network jack or wireless access point somewhere where people can come in and just uh, just plug a LAN cable and they can get connected to their network, these points should be protected if you're going if, if they are publicly accessible, right? So they should be physically protected or at least monitored. This is also there in PCIDSS requirement nine. Requirement 10 is the most difficult requirement, ladies and gentlemen, because it's a log management requirement. It very clearly tells you what should be logged, what kind of events have to be logged, all access to cardholder data, all admin act activities, all of this has to be captured in logs. And what should be captured in a log? The system, the time, the sorry, the date and the time, the user ID, the system ID, the uh, the nature of the event, the outcome of the event, all of this has to be captured. The best way to implement requirement 10 is to have a SIM solution, security information and event management solution. There are a lot of SIM tools available in the market today. Get in touch with us if you want to look at how to deploy a SIM solution for your organization. The next one is requirement 11, which tells you you need to perform regular testing and monitoring of your network itself. This means quarterly check for any wireless access points. If there's any rogue wireless access points set in your network, you should find out. This is the reason why you need to have a quarterly wireless access check carried out. Perform a quarterly internal vulnerability assessment as well as external vulnerability assessment. Now the catch here is external vulnerability assessment, which is pertaining to your uh, public facing IP addresses. You will have to hire an approved scanning vendor. You can't just do it by yourself and say, hey, all my external IP addresses, they've been scanned. They are good to go. No, you need to have them carried out by approved scanning vendors. These are companies authorized by the PCI Council to carry out these scans. So you need, you need to have four of these reports every year carried out every single quarter. You need to carry out pen testing as well every year. This can be carried out in-house. You don't need any ASV for this. You need to do it on internal IPs as well as external IPs. All of this comes in in requirement number 11. The last one is requirement 12, which talks a little bit about the governance side of security management. So it tells you you need to have an information security policy. You need to carry out a risk assessment. You need to have AUP in place, so on and so forth. It also tells you when you're hiring people, you need to carry out a background check. Also, once the people are onboarded, you need to have a security awareness program. Every year, they need to be trained on security requirements of the PCIDSS. Lastly, it tells you you need to have an incident management process in place as well. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the close of today's session. I do realize I'm four minutes uh, behind schedule. I do apologize for this. But like you've just seen, PCI DSS is huge. It is very granular, very specific. Achieving compliance with PCI, I will repeat this, it is no mean task. 
it, if you are certified PCI DSS, it means that your organization has re has reached a very, very good benchmark or baseline of security. It's a very, very respectable standard to have achieved certification against. If you're interested in pursuing compliance with PCI, we can assist you from Ingram Micro Cyber Security. Just um, contact us at cyber.meta at ingrammicro.com or drop in an email uh, to, to me itself. I'm more than happy to get in touch with you and walk you through. We can handhold you through the entire process. I hope the training was useful. If you have any questions, feel free, please, to type them into the chat window. Or you're most welcome to unmute as well. Uh, Praveen? Yes, yes, Mr. Uh, just uh, I remember that uh, nowadays, especially uh, since last uh, one year, it has been very much common now with the most of the merchants. And it has been more uh, aggressive nowadays due to COVID. The wireless payment of the credit card how secure it is because we have seen few videos on whatsapp circulating that people are just hacking the wireless cards by just posing the application near to the card by on the wallet something like that how secure how this works exactly okay it's a great question mr mir and um, you've uh, you've touched upon a very very important topic as well um security for uh, through wireless post terminals uh, this is this is a concern when for example you find that a hacker is holding a post terminal to your wallet you didn't even know that he was holding this and he's authorizing tra uh, transactions against your wallet um so there are two di two two dimensions to this the first scenario is when in an organization they are using wireless post terminals for wireless uh, uh, payments for example now these pass terminals, if they are compliant with PCI PTS, which is a more specific standard than PCI DSS, it is very, very specific to these pass terminals. It tells them how these terminals have to be configured, what protocols they can use, and also what specific wireless protocols they can connect over. So it'll have it'll have to be strong, uh, strongly encrypted wireless networks, not the uh, the old you know web protocols, for example, which can be easily cracked. So all of these specifications are easily carried out. This is in scenario one. So if you're if a company is coming to you and they are receiving wireless payments uh, and um, you are giving them your credit card, you should ensure that that their post terminal is at least compliant with PCI PTS. This is one scenario. The second scenario is when you and me as everyday individuals, as everyday residents and citizens, we are traveling on a train or a bus, for example, and we find that in a crowded metro, uh, a person is coming and holding this POS terminal against your wallet. This is another scenario. So this is when these people, they are seeing if they can, um, uh, you know, make these unauthorized transactions simply by touching um, people's wallets without their knowledge and if they can authorize any transactions. Uh, of course, again, uh, this is completely illegal and it's a crime. Um, these have been successful in many ways. Many of these accounts, people have reported uh, transactions being raised on their cards without their knowledge itself. The best way to protect against this is to invest in an RFID uh, protected, uh, RFID proof wallet. These wallets, there are specific wallets which can, which have the ability to block um, these RFID related incoming waves. So it makes sense sometimes to invest in these wallets which are which are protected against such wireless attacks if you are a regular traveler on a crowded uh, environment right now of course this is not the scenario with covid 19 but if yes it makes sense nowadays to invest in these kinds of wallets just to or just stay alert at the end of the day that's what i would say so th those were the two scenarios to this uh, question mr mir i hope i was able to discuss this or uh, add some light on it so you mean to say the wireless uh, connectivity from the card is not with the point of sale device or is it uh, the wireless uh, which is inside the because you know uh, uh, my card is uh, making payment by just touching the point of sale device because yes. it has uh, so it is uh, between the card and the uh, point of sale device right yeah yes yes and this this is like working with a special encryption uh, i mean to say data uh, on transfer encryption or what exactly i mean the yes the the tran the data will be encrypted but without your knowledge a transaction will be carried out on your card this is what the the criminal is carrying out so which is why we should be alert and ensure that you know 
where no so one is in, coming in. And, in in this case, who is responsible if anything is happening like this? In, because in, if one guy can know how it happens, he can steal a lot of money and then he is yes. just... This is equivalent to digital pickpocketing, if you ask me. So we as uh, end users, we have to be aware of digital pickpockets and make sure no one is trying to, you know, carry these out. By the way, uh, this is more common in Europe, these kinds of attacks. Uh, especially in the London metro, a lot of uh, scenarios have been uh, witnessed in this particular case. Most of the other parts of the world, um, it's a little bit more sophisticated form of attack. So it's not really picked up so much in the rest of the world, to, at least to my knowledge. Uh, correct me, Mr. Mir, if I'm wrong. Um, I've not seen these attacks being reported in the Middle East so much, but in Europe, yes, it's been it's been reported quite a lot. But it's it's equivalent to digital pickpocketing. So it's up to us to stay vigilant. I would I would say. So keeping safe is more with the pin than the number rather than just to be slow. But yeah. again, yeah. with COVID, this has changed because this is getting like compulsory. With there's a reason they minimize the payment amount to, to minimum like hundred and like the two hundred dollar real true. Uh, real true. something. True, true, sir, true. Absolutely. Or it, or we can... actually, it's in Middle East. It's still the new because not everyone is uh, involved. Maybe if some guy get criminal mind, then sure it will be spread too fast. True, 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 sir. True. Yeah. I mean, the only other way is to be a little extra careful and disable this uh, uh, tap payments on our cards. But that is not an option because pretty much every card has uh, NFC enabled. NFC is uh, enabled on the cards. So tap and pay is, is enabled by default on most cards these days. Right. So ladies and gentlemen, if there are no further questions, I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, I, I really thank you on behalf of Ingram Micro. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. Like the the, the websites, uh, you know, who are asking for, you know, to uh, to put this CVV number. Yeah. Are they storing the data? If if they are storing this CVV number, then uh, how we, we would know about this? Okay, like, okay. So 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 next time you are entering your your card number on a web page, just look for any logo which says this is certified PCI DSS by company X Y Z. Most of the time, these web pages, they will have this logo that they were certified um, in PCIDSS. If they are certified, you can be sure they are not storing the CVV anywhere. They are not supposed to store it as per PCIDSS. Uh, so most of the reputed merchant uh, payment gateways, the, you would definitely find this logo and you don't have to worry so much about um, the CVV being stored. Where you will have a problem is um, whenever there is a data security breach of payment card information, is cardholder numbers are allowed. You can you can store them in PCI DSS. So companies, payment gateways, merchants, banks, etc. They store the cardholder number. But requirement 3.4 tells us to encrypt the cardholder number. They will sometimes find a way around it. They will not encrypt the cardholder number. And when there is a breach, these unencrypted cardholder numbers are compromised. So that is when we have major cyber security attacks and uh, uh, you know millions of cardholder numbers have been breached. Penalties have to be paid. People's cards have to be uh, cancelled and new cards have to be issued and so on and so forth. Uh, so that the card number is what we should be really careful about. Um, if you're storing by default your card number on Zomato or any other apps, just make sure that you know you're only giving them to trusted apps, trusted uh, service providers and merchants. So it is a case if uh, someone uh, is, a, I mean to say, a criminal site is trying to collect a lot of information he will just sell the things at cheaper rate and uh, uh, collect for a time and and then have attack once and for get away from the scene right so uh, it's, you could put it that way mr meter so most of the time how criminals work is they when they hack an organization they get access to millions of card numbers, per personal information, etc. They don't use it for themselves. Rather, they put it for sale on the dark web and they try to monetize that. So there are other organizations who wish to purchase these cards. They want they specialize in identity theft or uh, they want to clone the cards or whatnot. So those are the individuals or organizations who will purchase these cards. And um, that's how the, the hackers, they make their money out of it. Or they get on the dark web and they monetize this.
Okay, okay. Thank you very much. It was really fantastic this session, and uh, I really like it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Mir. Thank you, sir. I'm very happy to speak to you after after the session as well to for further discussions. Mr. Abdul uh, Malik, thank you, sir, for your question as well. I hope it was helpful. And everybody else in the room, thank you so much for joining us. Thank uh, you, Praveen. Tirupati thank here. You. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Tirupati. It was a great pleasure today to speak to you about PCI DSS. Let me remind you, we have a two day training on PCI DSS as well. If you wish to go through a line by line training on the requirements, we have this training. I am the guy who is giving these trainings as well. More than happy to um, you know, deliver the trainings for you. Please get in touch. Our email ID is cyber.meter at ingrammicro.com, which I'll put into the chat right now. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you all. Ravin, this uh, is going to be uploaded on YouTube, right? For yes, yes, Mr. Mir. It will be on our uh, YouTube channel, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir.